So we've been discussing social theory and what it means for humanism. Uh, in the past few, over about a past month, I guess, we talked about Hobbes and Locke, we talked about Montesquieu and Rousseau, and the last couple discussions of these French Enlightenment thinkers really sort of led us into the French Revolution, which, to me, is just a fascinating study. And as I did the some background reading for this, I just you know, sort of recalled a little bit of what I learned in high school about the French Revolution, and then so much more that's just so fascinating, both on the new ideas that came out and obviously some of the dangers and threats of those ideas. I'm not gonna play this up as a positive thing in human history, but it's sort of a mixed bag. I had a university professor in physics who always described things as a mixed bag of flies. So that analogy you can think of. The French Revolution, I found, is one of the first places where systematic or organized atheism really existed since the Greeks. We had the Epicureans in ancient Greece who sort of rejected the notion of gods and sort of brought about a materialist worldview and started to organize a system of belief around that. But then there was just sort of the odd, you know, anti-theist thinker between then and the 1700s. So there was no, you know, people didn't get together and say, what if there's no God? What if all of these people around us are wrong? And so in 1770, uh, de Holbach in France produced The System of Nature, which was really one of the first atheist books of the time. And it, I think, was probably fit well among the modern atheist, new atheist thinkers and writers, where he describes materi the materials project. So there's, the mind is just our brain. There's no soul without a living body. The world is deterministic. He got rid of free will because it was just machines. Uh, he denied the existence of God, and he argued that belief in a higher being comes from fear, a lack of understanding, and anthropomorphism, something you hear from Hitchens or uh, Dawkins today. And so he sort of split it into mythology. He split religion into mythology, which was a way to maybe bring order to society, and these stories weren't necessarily bad, and theology, which raised power over nature and sort of systemized it. And he said that theology was really bad. And so he, he condemned the Roman Catholic Church and he heard similar things from Voltaire and other writers around the time. So it's really the first sort of cracks in the foundation of religion at the time. This all leads us to the French Revolution in 1789. And so we're sitting in a very mixed up Europe. France, as we recall, had been in a period of great wealth for the past or century almost, as there were periods of long stability among the uh, preceding kings. And this great wealth brought about many ideas, and so there was the Enlightenment, and people were thinking about new ideas and things. And during the revolution, we saw the absolutist regimes crash very fast in a matter of three years, and giving way to what the French said called liberté, égalité, and fraternité the motto I believe France still carries to this day. This was also, so I'll give you my sort of overview of my talk today. I'll talk about sort of the historical context of the French Revolution. Uh, then I'll go into the dechristianization project and why, how they sort of disassembled the Catholic Church's influence. And then I'll break it down and then I'll cover the cult of reason and the cult of supreme being, which are just fascinating case examples uh, to look at. And then I'll talk a bit about feminism that rose in the French Revolution, which is very fascinating on its own right, and then sort of try to draw some lessons from all of this, and hopefully I can make it all sound sensical, because I sort of put this together in a very short span last night and didn't get a good night's sleep. So the French Revolution was really preceded by an economic collapse. The church, or the king was pushing a lot of regressive taxes to you know, fund his lavish lifestyle of the monarchy, and a bunch of wars they were really bad at at the time. So they were wasting money, people were getting annoyed, and all of this money was coming from the poor, so they weren't happy. The rich started to rebel and said, we're not paying your taxes. And so they tried to push further on the poor, and everything sort of came to a head in 1789. Uh, he tried to solve this political impasse by calling the Estache Générale sort of the first attempt at a democracy in France, and he divided it into three houses. He gave one to the clergy won to the nobility, which was basically the 2% of the time. So they were a little more open than today's 1%. And then the third house for the common folk. 
well, this didn't work very well because the common folk didn't like the other two groups. They rebelled and left and created the National Assembly, which they decided was more egalitarian and represented the people because it was just that. The nobility had also refused to help the king by paying taxes, and so you just had this sort of collapse of the whole political system. The National Assembly was basically started when they tried to kick the commoners out of the Esas General, and they just assembled on a tennis court in Versailles and took the tennis court oath, where they said, um, this is our first opposition to the king, we're going to start our own democracy, and they can live with it. Things escalated fast. Uh, in July, the, the they stormed the Bastille Paris in France, er, the Bastille Fortress in Paris, and it fell quickly, signaling just how popular this rebellion was among people. Uh, they said the National Assembly was intoxicated with liberty and enthusiasm at the time. People were really into this idea. Uh, in August, they passed the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen. This is a really founding document to the French Revolution. And it's really sort of a constitution of what they wanted to see. It followed the US Declaration of Independence and really enshrined the idea of natural laws, that rights could be inherent to human and didn't require a supernatural creator to put them in us and really put universal rights in. The first one specifically says, men are born and remain free and equal in rights. Social distinctions may be founded only upon the general good. So you can't have an aristocratic, aristocrat, aristocratic class and you can't you know, give clergy special space. And this document really included all of the ideas we've talked about, the ideas of Rousseau and the social contract. It talked about Montesquieu's ideas of the separation of powers and the liberty of the English thinkers before. And it was one of the first times they enshrined free speech as a right. Unfortunately, it was declared only for men. And this led to, in November of 1789, again, things happened really fast, uh, the women's petition to the National Assembly, which called for women's equality. After that wasn't really listened to, or just before that, it was also preceded by a march of 7,000 women on the National Assembly in Versailles, and they called for equality and a bunch of other things, including gender-free language and the right to wear pants. So they really, they covered the whole thing. I don't want to demean them by saying that, but that's sort of the level of regressiveness of the times is they had to ask for the right to wear pants. One of their quotes is, you have broken the scepter of despotism. You have pronounced the beautiful axiom that the French are a free people yet you still allow 13 million slaves shamefully to wear the irons of 13 million despots. You have defined the true equality of rights, and you still unjustly withhold them from the sweetest and most interesting half among you. It's the women sort of saying, you've made us slaves, now free us as well. So it's really almost just watching the sort of men revolt against the church and state led the women of the time to realize we can demand our own rights as well. Uh, they further stated in the Declaration of Rights of Women and the Female Citizen in 1791, this revolution will only take effect when all women become fully aware of their deplorable condition and the rights they have lost in society. And this sort of idea is one of the ones that perhaps demonstrates where the revolution failed. Um, the D male declaration also failed to denounce slavery at the time, and you saw France later fell into more turmoil when the Haitian slaves revolted. In 1792, they declared France a republic, and they subsequently executed the king the next year, uh, which sort of drew attention to what was happening in France to the rest of Europe, so they decided it was a weak time. And the, nobis, or the people at the time also felt very empowered, and because there was so much support for the revolution, everyone sort of radicalized. Things got out of hand. Uh, and they started going to war with everyone. So the French Revolutionary Wars basically ran from 1792 to 1801. And the only reason they really won is because Napoleon took them over and they became the Napoleonic Wars. And unlike the previous wars of the king that I guess the French didn't really care about, these were actually effective wars. And the, for a while, they were able to cover most of Europe with French armies. 
but they did take a lot of conscription at the time. Uh, the radicalization of the French Revolution really led to the gross uh, power of Robespierre and the Jacobins. And the Committee of Public Safety led the reign of terror from 1793 to 94, which killed between 16 and 40,000 people, depending on which resources you look at. The whole thing sort of, I guess, came unhinged in 1799 when Napoleon came to power and consolidated as emperor. And it basically took all of Europe to stand up to Napoleon to end his reign. But Napoleon's reign almost and his six military successes, in a way, led to those revolutionary ideas spreading across Europe. So it almost raises the question, would the French ideas of liberté, égalité, and fraternity have spread without Napoleon conquering the entire continent? Maybe it would have been slower. Moving into the dechristianization of uh, France at the time, you have to understand how incredibly powerful the Catholic Church was in France prior to the revolution. The Catholic Church owned 10% of the country's land, and 95% of the people identified as Catholic. The church was exempt from taxes and collected a 10% tithe from the entire population. They had immense support from the king and were basically enshrined under the Ancien Regime, uh, which institutionalized its authority. It gave clergy the space in the first estate, as I talked about, tithe powers, and they also controlled basically education, health care, and vital statistics, the registries of birth, death, and marriage. The entire society was run by the Catholic Church, basically. And there were a few small Protestant communities across France, which allied with the Enlightenment thinkers of Voltaire and sort of rallying against the Church's power. When the Estat General collapsed in France, the clergy actually joined the National Assembly, hoping to, I think, maintain some of their influence, which didn't last long. Uh, things like for the king went downhill really fast for the church. Uh, in August 9, 1789, the National Assembly abolished the clergy's or the church's ability to tithe. Uh, in December, they made all church property at the disposal of the nation. They basically nationalized all of their land and said, "If you, if the French Revolution needs your land, we're going to take it." Uh, they abolished the monastic vow. It was basically the idea that they could formally declare celibacy or priesthood in the fall of 89, and in February of 1790, the religious orders were just dissolved, and monks and nuns were told to, told to return to civil life, and a very small number did. Uh, in July of 1790, they essentially nationalized the Catholic Church in France by passing the civil constitution of the clergy. Uh, priests and bishops were told to become state employees uh, were supposed to be elected by their local people, and their pay rate was set by the National Assembly. So imagine the government of Canada basically saying to all the churches, you're now government employees, you're going to be elected by us, by your people, and we're going to set your pay rate. This did not sit well with Pope Pius VI at the time, who sort of tried to decide how to play it because he didn't want to lose the entire France. He didn't want to lose France to the revolutionary forces, but he also couldn't accept this. So after a few months of deliberation, he decided to reject the civil constitution, which broke the French Catholic Church in half, not quite in half. Only about a quarter of the French priests and bishops actually joined the National Assembly in their ideas, and they became sort of constitutional clergy or jurors, and the rest were basically deemed traitors to the state, uh, and many of those were executed as became the way of the French Revolution. In September of 1792, the National Assembly actually legalized divorce. And I was looking into some of the stats and trying to figure out what other countries had. And most Catholic countries at the time didn't actually legalize divorce. What was interesting is Ireland only legalized divorce in 1996. 1996. So 200 years after France did it. And right now, the only places you can't get divorced in the world are the Philippines and Vatican City. The state also at the time, in 1792, assumed control of the vital statistics registries and the church became viewed as counter-revolutionary. So as soon as you basically became counter-revolutionary, the guillotine came down on you. In Paris, on September 2nd, 1792, chaos basically erupted as 
mobs started going after the churches. Remember, this was a country that was 95% Catholic that is now murdering bishops and priests. Uh, three bishops and 200 priests were murdered in the September massacres as people basically decided the church was against the revolution. They started going really hard into anti-church mode after that, passing more and more laws that basically seized gold and secularized France. Uh, they started destroying Catholic iconic iconography around the places. Uh, they tore down statues and plates. They banned crosses in public. And they banned the church bells from ringing and destroyed many of these artifacts. You sort of see this any time a revolution happens. The Islamists moving south after the Arab Spring destroyed many religious artifacts that they disagreed with. In this way, it's not the first time history tends to repeat itself. They also tried to not just destroy the Catholic Church, but replace it with something secular, more civil, revolutionary, appropriate. And this led to a lot of very interesting ideas. One of the ones that I'll use as an example is the French Republican calendar, which was passed in 1793. At the time, they were really trying to base things on reason and rationality. Uh, for example, we can thank them for the metric system, where instead of sort of arbitrary units of length, like inches and feet, you now have factors of 10 going all the way down, or 100. Uh, the French Republican calendar tried to decimalize time and remove all religious references from the calendar. So I'll give you an example of how it worked. They got rid of all the Sabbath days, and they removed all religious references from the calendar. Uh, years were basically given in Roman numerals, marking the anniversary of the Declaration of the French Republic, which if you want to celebrate, it was September 22nd, 1792. So if you want to use this calendar, count from there, and that's what year it is. The idea of Roman numerals is not the most efficient, though that was rational. <laughs> the year was divided into 12 months, uh, each month was divided into three weeks of ten days. Uh, the tenth day would be not Sunday, which would be your day of rest and festivity. Uh, so you only got one day off for ten days, which was one of the reasons this didn't catch on. <laughs> I was trying to think of a better way to do it. I think you could do it if you did three days off, two days on, or three days on, two days off, four days on, one day off, and have a two-day weekend or one-day weekend might be able to get the right amount of days off. Or you could do 3-2, three, 3-2, two, three, two, and just relax. That'd be the new European model. Yeah. If, if you're doing the math, uh, we don't have enough days to make a year because of the way our sun goes, or planet goes around the sun. So they added five or six extra days at the end of the calendar to basically make sure that the number of days fit properly. And it would be a six day every um, leap year. Time got really interesting, and they actually made some clocks to fit this, where each day was divided into 10 hours, each hour into 100 minutes, and each minute into 100 seconds. It makes it so much easier to count. A decimal, so a decimal hour, or the French hour, would be 144 of our minutes, which is basically just over two hours. So that gives you an idea of what it would look like. They could have maybe done 20 hours, and it would be very similar, but. And they did manufacture clocks that would count like this. And it would be fascinating to see one right beside a 12-hour clock. But they did not catch on again. They also changed all the names of months to really try to represent nature. And they gave each day a uh, very, each day in the Catholic Church had a saint associated with it. Because there are that many saints in Catholicism in 1790. And so they changed it so that each day would have an animal, a tool, or also plant or mineral named after it. Uh, the months, if you're interested, autumn was divided into grape harvest, fog, and frost months. Winter was the snowy, rainy, and windy months. Spring was germination, flower, and pasture months. And summer was the harvest, summer heat, and fruit months. Uh, the English wanted to make fun of them, and so they called it the wheezy, sneezy, and freezy months, the slippy, drippy, and nippy months, the showery, flowery, and bowery months, and the weedy, heedy, and sweetie months. <laughs> Whichever those will catch on. There. During all of this sort of anti-clerical movement, they forced the Archbishop of Paris to resign 
and they actually took his mitre, his fancy hat, and they made him wear a red cap of liberty to show his allegiance. And they held anti-clerical parades. So again, a country that was 95% Catholic is holding parades against the Catholic Church. Uh, religious places and street names were changed. Religious holidays were basically outlawed and replaced with secular alternatives like harvest festivals. Once Robespierre was arrested in 1794, public worship was legalized again. So you were not allowed to worship in public, so they didn't have freedom of religion in their constitution, but with limitations. So church bells still couldn't ring and the Christian crosses were still banned in public. And priests were still arrested until 1799 and they actually captured Pope Pius VI, and he died in French captivity. So they were that anti-Catholic that they arrested the Pope. Uh, basically, the anti-Catholic uh, push ended when Napoleon signed the Concordat with Rome and got along smoothly. One of the moves during this uh, anti-Catholic, anti-Christian regime was the cult of reason. Uh, and I want to emphasize that cult in its translation from French doesn't mean what we think of as cult in English. It's more a form of worship without the negative connotation, so it's more just celebrating you know, religion of reason. Uh, it was established by revolutionary radicals as an atheistic belief system to replace the church. So they actually went all the way and said, we're going to have a materialistic view that's going to replace religion. Uh, you'll recall Rousseau argued that we should have a civic religion which had to be religious because atheism would lead to the downfall of society, and we'll get back to that again. But here was people standing up and saying, potentially for the first time, atheism and reason can be a basis for society. Uh, the cult of reason was humanocentric, and sort of a pre-humanism where the goal was perfection of humanity through the attainment of truth and liberty, and its guiding principle was reason. The names are completely unfamiliar to me, sadly. Jacques Herbert Hibert, Antoine Francois Momoro, Pierre Gaspard Chaumat, and Joseph Boucher are sort of the leading thinkers of the time that I'll let you look up later. And the way I can think of this is it's sort of like what they're trying to do with the London Secular Assembly or the Calgary Secular Church now, is really bring the best, what they saw as the best parts of community from religion and then celebrate humanity from it. It's a very fascinating idea. So when people talk about the idea of an atheistic church being a new one, it's not. It's at least you know, 300 years old. But you can argue it's more. Uh, one quote from it is, there's one thing that must not, that we, one thing they talked about in their church is they weren't idling reason. It wasn't becoming their new god, even though they had a goddess of reason at times. I'll get back to that in a second. They said, there is one thing that must not we must not tire of telling people. Liberty, reason, and truth are only abstract beings. They are not gods. For property, for properly speaking, they are part of ourselves. So it wasn't about looking outside to this idea of reason as the goddess. It was about we can find reason within ourselves and that can help guide our lives. Very humanist almost. Except for when they guillotined everyone. Uh, Joseph Boucher, uh, Part of their move was to really push cult of reason over Catholic Church, and so they, you know, Joseph Boucher suggested that gravestones couldn't bear Catholic sayings or religious sayings. They had to, they could only really declare death is an eternal sleep. So they really tried to remove the supernatural from it. They held a festival of reason uh, in the second year of the French calendar, or 1793, and they turned many of the churches into temples of reason. Uh, Notre Dame in Paris held the largest festival, and the altar was changed from Christian one to support to one dedicated to liberty, and they carved two philosophy over the cathedral's doors. The festival ended with the appearance of the goddess of reason, who they didn't want you to worship her, so they had a woman stand in for her place. I get how that worked. But. And they would say things like, one god only, le people, or one god, the people, so we only worship people, not uh, deities. Robespierre wasn't part of the cult of reason, and he saw its growing popularity in 1794, and he really resented that strength. 
basically, if you upset Robespierre or suggested that people would come to you and he disagreed with you, <laughs> he had no time for that. So he outlawed it and he established a deistic alternative. Because Robespierre did believe in God and he did think atheism would lead to the downfall of society. He was an enemy. He was a very Rousseau kind of idea about that, about civic religion. So from Robespierre, we basically have the cult of the supreme being, which he essentially just came up with himself. This was intended to become the state religion of France at the time, and was announced in May of 1794. <coughs> the basic idea of the cult of the supreme being was reason was only a means to an end, and that end is virtue. Uh, beyond, so there had to be deism, but it wasn't just simple deism. We also had to have a rational devotion to God. Uh, God had to exist, and there was a human soul that would be that would survive death and be immortal. And Robespierre believed this would be a way to promote civic-minded virtue among the people, sort of how the Greek and Roman religions helped keep people in line. And it had to require fidelity to liberty and democracy. Uh, for Robespierre, this belief in God was so important because he saw it as the only way to ensure a higher moral code, higher moral code, and would be a constant reminder of justice, which would be essential to Republican society. So he held a festival of the Supreme Being in 1794, and the largest one was in Paris, hosted by Robespierre himself. And local events were basically mandatory. He declared the truth of his religion and that it had social utility. So unlike the cult of reason, this one is necessary and true. Uh, it's argued, argued by some that this sort of devotion to the cult of the Supreme Being helped lead to the demise of Robespierre, and eventually Napoleon just banned both of them because they clearly caused problems. Turning to feminism now, briefly, if you'll recall from my talk of Rousseau, he was very sexist, and many of the ideas of France were sexist at the time. <clears throat> Rousseau's ideas, though, weren't extreme. They were sort of the norm. And women were considered passive across France. The encyclopedia, written by Diderot and others, said women were failed men, uh, that a woman's testimony is in general light and subject to variation. This is why it is taken, this is why it is taken more seriously than that of men. This is why it is not as opposed to men who nature seems to have conferred the right to govern. In general, men are more capable than women of ably governing particular matters. So they, pre-revolutionary France, they had this very sexist ideas. The revolution, though, showed that you could fight against the established ideas and really rise up. And I think this inspired a lot of feminists and women at the time who saw men declaring their freedom and then women said, well, what about us? Why can he go out, but I can't? Why does he get to wear pants, but I can't have to wear the skirts and dresses? So it was really led by a number of women, and I'll try and mention a few of them. Pauline Leon started the Society of Revolutionary Republican Women, and she argued for equal rights, and they had many riots. You know, they called for the right to bear arms, and they wanted to start uh, women, female armed guards that could help patrol and protect the strength of the revolution. So the women were on board with the revolution if they could be recognized as equals. They attracted 7,000 women, as I spoke about, to march on Versailles. But again, any time you sort of challenge the revolution, you're deemed a traitor, and many female leaders were declared <coughs> enemies of the state. Many were arrested, exiled, or even executed. Therine de Maricourt was arrested, publicly flogged, and then spent the rest of her life's sentence to an insane asylum. Pauline Luan, who I just mentioned, and Claire Lacombe were arrested, later re released, but continued to receive abuse and ridicule for their activism. Unfortunately, for this first major feminist push in history, it really failed. Uh, perhaps this, but it, perhaps it set the right, or grounds for future revolutions and you know, sort of the modern feminist movements. I maybe could even argue that without the support of the women, the revolution was doomed to fail. Um, but as women weren't included in the revolution, 
as many sort of resented, especially the dechristianization, which sort of ruined their normalcy. So this might be the more rural women who had a way of life that wasn't equal, but they were used to. And many of them, as they were so pushed down further by the revolution, became defenders of the faith and were on board with the Catholic Church. So they helped hide the priests and bishops, and they supported reestablishing the church with the Concordat. So perhaps including those women in the revolution might have prevented the return of the Catholic Church to France. Not that we should have purged it the way they did. <coughs> Turning finally to what lessons we can draw from all of this, I think the revolution offers many lessons and warnings. It's just a fascinating thing. <coughs> and what I talked about is just what I learned in a few hours on Wikipedia. There's so much more out there. The revolution was sadly very violent. Uh, it shows how we can radicalize our ideas so quickly, and we need to always be careful of that. I don't think any of us condones the mass purge of religion or the executions of the times, even though it does offer a unique view of how can we replace religion with ideas like the cult of the reason. I think a huge part of that was that they didn't recognize the need for freedom of religion. This is one thing that Locke had taught us, that we need to respect diversity and tolerate differences of opinion and not try to force everyone to our view. This is arguably one of the first widespread attempts at state atheism and widespread secularism, and was really perhaps the first actual ex widespread acceptance of atheist beliefs. Uh, we don't have poll numbers from the time, unfortunately. But you do get to see that this was crushed by deism. So people who want to take a negative view here could say even deism can be used for evil. Uh, what the entire movement did was show that the church wasn't all powerful, and it did break the power of the Catholic Church in France, probably for good. It managed to return, but it didn't come back in the same way. It's never had that same influence over French society. The revolution brought us some very early Declaration of Rights, the idea of a republic and representation. It wasn't the first republic that America had started in 1776. But it was sort of the same thinkers were important in both. The revolution definitely awakened feminism. It definitely brought the idea that women should have equal rights to the forefront. And it really just showed a massive shift of power from aristocrats and religion to the common people and the everyman. While the revolution ultimately failed, it break, broke that power in such a way that it never returned again. And it really cemented what I think is the unique French concept of la cité, or the French secularism which is very unique to more of an English or North American secularism, where the state shouldn't just be neutral on faith, but almost hostile towards it. I like to think that secularism can be done in two ways. You can have either the all or nothing approach. <coughs> Excuse me. Because the state can't pick any side, it either has to sort of endorse everyone and nothing, or just be completely out of it. And the French model is definitely get the state out of religion, don't have any attempt to endorse it, so they take they ban public employees from wearing crosses. They ban curpens in the Quebec National Assembly. Uh, burkas and nightcaps are not really allowed in society. So it's really suppressed religious belief. Keep it to yourself. There's your freedom of religion, but don't bring it out to public, which is very different than the sort of pluralistic, let everyone multiculturally exchange their ideas, which is more the Canadian or English model. And by Canadian, English Canadian. So it's a very fascinating subject. I'd love to discuss this more with you, because some of you probably know much more about it, but 